Coming up, the life of a diplomat. But in the meantime, I developed this reputation as sort of a rogue diplomat, a little out of control, and uh, the neoconservatives uh, never gave that a rest. Former U.S. Ambassador Christopher Hill gives an inside look at Washington and his time in South Korea and Iraq. It's just ahead on Global Ethics Forum. Our speaker, Chris Hill, is one of our country's most distinguished career diplomats. His experiences cover a span of over 30 years working for 11 secretaries of state and several presidents, which make the reading of his memoir, Outpost, all the more riveting and exciting. A career as a diplomat is not always easy, and Ambassador Hill admits that diplomacy doesn't always work. Yet through it all, whether in times of war or in periods of relative calm, Ambassador Hill has been persistent and creative as he searched for practical solutions to address the numerous challenges our country has faced, even when the primary objective seemed elusive. I always start, though, in talking about this contemporary world uh, we live in by um, a, a quote from one of my uh, favorite Polish party first secretaries. Um, he was a guy named Władysław Gomułka. And uh, Władysław uh, Gomułka, a name kind of lost to history, actually, but uh, he was known for very long speeches and very uh, unsuccessful uh, metaphors. And uh, one day, he, he stood up in front of a big crowd in Kraków, in southern Poland. And uh, he was, of course, late, so you had all these people, you know, sort of grumpy sitting there and waiting for the party for a secretary. And he got up in front of them and he said, comrades, he always addressed everybody as comrade, comrades, just a few years ago, our fatherland stood on the very edge of a deep abyss and I'm telling you today that we have taken an important step forward. <laughs> and, and so, but anyway, so, um, you know, I think as we look at some of these contemporary crises, it might be wise uh, not to take that important step forward, but rather to take an important step back and kind of consider where we are, how we got here, and where we, where we might go. Um, I must say, um, Joanne very kindly pointed out that I did write in the book as a kind of disclaimer that dipl diplomacy doesn't always work. I just felt a diplomat ought to say that. I'd rather hear it from me than Dick Cheney, you know. So, um, who does make an appearance in the book? Uh, falling asleep in the Oval Office during, during a, you know, I really tried to avoid score settling. I really did. I mean, I avoided it as much as I could, but when I saw in his book, he talks about what a terrible person Condoleezza Rice and I were in terms of uh, the uh, North Korea negotiations, kind of completely missing the point of what we were trying to accomplish there. A lot of what we were trying to accomplish was not so much disarming North Korea, although that would have been a heck of a nice bonus. It was to try to patch up a seriously declining relationship with South Korea, where we found after the first Bush term that in South Korea, some 45, 50% of South Koreans were blaming us for North Korea's nuclear ambitions. Now, when you have created victims out of North Koreans, I mean, you talk about a kind of uh, hideous alchemy. I mean, you're obviously doing something wrong. And so I think uh, Secretary Rice and President Bush understood that after that first term, where we had two wars not going very well, Afghanistan and Iraq, we didn't need a third crisis in the world. And moreover, if we're, having, if we're gonna have any chance of um, dealing with the, uh, with the problems of uh, of uh, North Korea, we're going to have to do it in a kind of multilateral um, uh, diplomatic framework, which is one of the great ironies of the six-party talks dealing with North Korea, because uh, President Bush felt very strongly we needed to get the Chinese involved, not that we're outsourcing our diplomacy, but they needed to be involved. And we had to, in Secretary Rice's uh, phraseology, we had to uh, create these patterns of cooperation. And I would say that as we engaged with North Korea, um, we put to rest the notion that the U.S. was uncaring and uh, uninterested in South Korea, and in fact created uh, patterns of cooperation with China and with South Korea. You know, at one point, I was asked to uh, 
go and talk to the North Koreans with the understanding the North Koreans were going to announce that they would participate in the six-party talks at the end of the meeting. So Secretary Rice said to me, all right, the president has approved this, but you have to do it in a Chinese government facility and with the Chinese present. That is, we didn't want to undermine a, uh, a uh, multilateral diplomacy by just having a U.S.-North Korea thing. Our embassy in Beijing comes up with a Chinese government facility, which happened to be the business center be behind the St. Regis Hotel. I remember asking the embassy, this is the best you could do for a Chinese government facility behind the St. Regis Hotel? And um, the Foreign Service officer, his name was Edgar Kagan, he said, look, they own a lot of things around here. Uh, they even own our embassy, but we didn't think that was appropriate. So, <laughs> So anyway, I go there, and uh, there are no Chinese, and we had been calling the Chinese uh, all day. And the Chinese, you know, they are, for all their great uh, wisdom and uh, forward thinking, their way of um, not giving you the answer uh, that you don't want to hear is just not picking up the telephone. So we had spent a whole day trying to find out if they were going to be attending this thing. And then finally, so I show up at this business center, and we had a little uh, dinner late on. No Chinese, but no North Koreans either. So, um, so I turned to Edgar, and I, I thought Edgar and I were going to have a nice, you know, romantic dinner together. And, uh, and I told Edgar, uh, you know, call up your friends in the North Korean mission and find out what's going on. And so. He calls him up and he, and he cups the phone against his chest and he told me, uh, they want to know, uh, are the Chinese there? And so, you know, by rights, I probably should have just called it all off. And, uh, but I thought about it and I didn't have long to think about it because Edgar kept pointing menacingly with his other finger at the telephone saying, come on, we don't have all day for this. And so um, I thought, okay, I could try to reach Secretary Rice and, uh, but she was actually in the air, and for people who watch movies and think it's easy to make phone calls from airplanes, it ain't at all. So, uh, so I, um, I realized I couldn't really get her, but if I, wanted, if I really wanted to persist, I'd have to basically cancel the talks. And would she really want me to cancel the talks? In fact, would she even want me to ask her, should I cancel the talks? So I thought through all that, and I said, the heck with it, let's go forward, and let's do it. And so, uh, I told Edgar to tell the North Koreans that the Chinese are not here and are you coming? So I remember they came out from the airport peering to both sides and what, what I called, what I did was calling an audible, you know, in football terminology and I realized there are no such things as audibles in the uh, North Korean foreign ministry. But anyway, they sat down, they made, um, we agreed on an announcement, we announced it, it was a big deal. Uh, Secretary Rice did a, arrive in uh, Beijing late that night on some other business, so the, but the diplomatic choreography was very good. And then she said, um, she said, well, it was a good result, but a very bad, uh, bad uh, format that uh, the Chinese had failed to arrive, and she was really giving Li Jiaoxing a hard time. Condi Rice wrote in her memoir that I was at times petulant with people. So I told her, you know, being a good Balkan, Balkan peasant, I'll get back at you in a time and place of my choosing. <laughs> so uh, I have her in my book saying something like, and so Rice shot back in her petulant best <laughs> that, uh, that you, the Chinese, had failed to show. Anyway, she finally gave it a rest. But in the meantime, I developed this reputation as sort of a rogue diplomat, a little out of control. And uh, the neoconservatives uh, never gave that a rest. I mean, they all felt that, uh, you know, that somehow I had, mis I had uh, ignored my instructions. This was something that came up in my, uh, in my hearing a few, years, uh, a few years later. I um, had to make a decision. I think I made the right decision that day, and I stand by it today. So um, as, we go f as we went forward, of course, we were not able to reach a deal with the North Koreans. We got them to shut down their nuclear reactor. We got them to disable their nuclear reactor. We got them to blow up the cooling tower. Um, not bad. Uh, you know, it took a long time. But ultimately, they didn't give us the means to inspect um, places of our choosing. We could only inspect places of their choosing. And that was uh, not an acceptable verification regime. 
And um, why they had suddenly tightened up and made things more difficult is um, hard to say. Kim Jong-il, I think everyone knew in the summer of 2008, had actually become Kim Jong very ill when he had a stroke and was clearly not in a capacity to kind of give instructions. Uh, lo and behold, there's a rather strict verticality with how uh, decisions are made in North Korea. So um, we didn't get the kind of verification we wanted. And then as we fast forward to today on that issue, I think it's pretty clear that while Kim Jong-il may have had some interest in pursuing these negotiations, I mean, they wanted us to certainly give them some kind of light water reactor that could produce electricity. And you have to bear in mind, North Korea does not have any, um, any oil or, or adequate coal, for example. So it was not a crazy thing to ask that they have some kind of nuclear facility to produce electricity. They also don't have much electricity. But clearly, a country that has cheated on everything they've ever agreed to is not a country that could be in a position of asking for any kind of nuclear technology. So we, we did not go forward uh, with that. And um, to this day, we have a situation where North Korea is, first of all, um, trying to develop nuclear uh, material through the other means, which is through centrifuges. And there are also even uh, rumors that they've restarted the Yongbyon reactor. Yongbyon is where their nuclear program is. The North Koreans uh, clearly, I think, have never really, they've never given up these nuclear aspirations. And I think it's fair to say that Kim Jong-un has zero interest in this. But I don't believe that we, should be thinking in terms of uh, having some kind of regular dialogue with North Korea in the absence of clear understandings that they need to fulfill their obligations made in September 2005, reaffirmed from a, for about four years from that time, that they have to abandon all their nuclear programs. And I don't think we should let them off the hook. That said, I wish we could kind of take out some of the hoopla that we have in this country about talking to bad guys. Um, I realize the North Koreans are as bad as it gets, but you know, uh, I used to deal with Milosevic a lot in the Balkans, and um, he was not a lot of fun to talk to either. But you know, I found that whenever we were especially mad at him, you'd get people in Washington, well, we shouldn't go talk to Milosevic. Well, that's brilliant, except that eventually you'd have to talk to him. And he's even worse than he was before because he's surrounded by these sycophants who kind of give him the wrong message, and with the consequence being that when you talk to him, you found him even more truculent than he was before, and you had to spend the first few hours kind of coaxing him down from his tree uh, onto you know, the ground so that he understood what the issue was. So I'm all in favor of talking to these people. I, I don't think the United States should ever be afraid to, uh, to talk to somebody. But I think it needs to be very clear that we are not going to improve relations with North Korea until they acknowledge and agree to an implementation program uh, for getting rid of their nuclear weapons. Whether they're ever able to do that, again, I don't, I'm not optimistic. I don't see Kim Jong-un interested. But I am optimistic that there is a kind of turn of the wheel in China these days, and that the Chinese are getting more and more sick of this. And uh, I think that is also a dividend of the six-party talks, where the United States, we really did everything we could do. Cynics would say, well, we were doing it uh, because somehow uh, um, you know, we had this double header going on with uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. We had to give the North Korean stuff. We weren't giving them anything. We were simply engaging as we should have been doing in the first place. So um, I think uh, the Chinese have come to understand that the U.S. has really tried through this exercise. And I think there's a lot less in China about blaming the United States. So I think we need to stick with that, stick with that program. I'd like to see uh, more efforts by the U.S. to help protect our allies, uh, uh, South Korea and, and Japan, in the form of, I think we, be, we should be talking missile defense with those countries. I think the, China needs to understand that uh, the North Korean program is, nuclear program, is creating 
imagining a situation where maybe their own nuclear program could be obsolete at some point. That's kind of hardball, but that's kind of what you have to play in this, in this game. So um, I think it is the right policy to work with China. It's not an outsourcing. And I think uh, when you talk to people in Shanghai, uh, they would like to throw the North Koreans under the bus as soon as they can. The problem is, in China, there's a real division of uh, views there. There are many Chinese who regard a North Korean collapse and a South Korean uh, uh, successor state as a victory for America and a defeat for China. There's a lot of this kind of zero-sum thinking that goes on in China. I think we need to take that on with the Chinese, have these kind of futuristic discussions, even if the Chinese don't like it and won't listen to it the first 50 times. I think we need to really work through that. And so I hope uh, we will continue at it with the Chinese. We'll continue to hold the South Koreans and the Japanese very close because Japan, in particular, is going through a lot of difficult times, whether it's nationalism or something worse. Um, I'm not of the view that Japan is going to go back to the 1930s, but I think it's very important that the United States has a good relationship with Japan, and I think it's very important for the entire region. So I hope we can continue to do that and uh, really be patient but be firm that North Korea needs to um, get rid of these nuclear weapons. And so when I left the North Korean account, Hillary Clinton called me upstairs, this was about two days after the inaugural, and she was convinced that the North Koreans were simply waiting for the new administration to come in. Uh, you know, they were kind of bored with the Bush administration, we're going to look to the Obama administration. So I thought that she wanted another memo on North Korea, so I went up to her office about 4.30 in the afternoon, it was a couple of days after the inaugural, and I walk in and I noticed all the furniture had been rearranged since uh, Secretary Rice had left uh, a couple of days earlier. You know, the wing chairs were in different places and I was sort of looking around a little <laughs> disoriented. And uh, she asked me to sit down in one of the wing chairs. And uh, so I, I sat down. I'd never sat in one of the wing chairs. The way it works in the Secretary's office is that's for the visitor. You sit in a hardback chair if you have a chair at all. And so, uh, so there I was in the wing chair kind of looking around. And then I noticed she had her deputy secretary there, Jim Steinberg. She had her undersecretary there, Bill Burns. And she had uh, Cheryl Mills, her, uh, her chief of staff. And so um, she started saying all these nice things to me about my career. And I felt like Frodo Baggins, you know, sitting back in the wing chair, you know, and thinking, you know, after my adventures and thinking, oh, isn't this wonderful? Hillary Clinton saying all these nice things. And then she says, and so I'd like you to go out to uh, Baghdad on one more adventure. <laughs> so I said, well, let me make three points. First, I'm very, in the Foreign Service, you never make two points, and you never, ma you certainly never make four, because that, uh, <laughs> it's always three points. So I said, well, let me make three points. Uh, one, I'm very honored. Two, I know how important it is. And three, I need to think about this. So, uh, so I um, went home that night, and I thought about this awful, awful situation in Iraq, what it's done to us, what it's done to Iraq, what it may have actually done to the entire region. And, and I thought, well, I don't want to tell my grandkids that, you know, the Secretary of State asked me to go and I turned her down. So I came back in the morning and said, I'll do it. And so uh, I head out there. Uh, it was the usual fun with the uh, uh, ambassadorial uh, selection process, you know, in the State Department. Basically, they're always worried that the Senate committee will figure out a way to hold you. So the State Department, really, they try to do their due diligence so there are no surprises. And, um, and then this due diligence uh, is a question of, they have these questionnaires, you know, I mean, probably a few years ago it was like 20 questions, and then there was the issue of do you have a nanny uh, that hasn't paid taxes? Do you have a, someone who mows your grass? And before you know it, you got about 800 questions. And then, uh, you know, you go through that, and you get through all the, the checks, and then some paralegal from the State Department law, law office um, they call you up and you, you go there. And this all happened within like a 10-day period because they really put it on a fast track because my pre predecessor in Iraq had already left, Ryan Crocker, so there was no ambassador there for, 
And so uh, the paralegal, I noticed she had gone to Wellesley and uh, she was um, about my daughter's age. So, you know, I said, oh, do you know my daughter, Amy? And then, and then she, um, she said, you know, Mr. Ambassador, I am so impressed with all the things you've done in your career. And she kind of goes through my whole career. So I just, um, you have done great things for our country, for the world. I'm like, okay, this is all right. And so I just have a few questions that we ask all our nominees. And I said, sure, go ahead. The first question is, have you ever been arrested for public drunkenness? <laughs> and so goes through all of that. And so eventually, eventually you get confirmed. I mean, it, it's a little like what I imagine childbirth to be. You, 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 you don't remember the bad parts. <laughs> and so anyway, it all seemed fine. And then um, get out there. And then uh, I realized, first of all, we had an embassy there that under the chief of mission, that is under the ambassador, you had some 15,000 people. Now, admittedly, a lot of them were Peruvian security guards. Uh, <laughs> why, why Peruvian, by the way? Because you, you, know, you, couldn't, you couldn't count on the Iraqi police and you couldn't even hire Iraqis, so they had a uh, contract uh, and a subcontractor in Peru. And so, um, so you had all these guys who sort of looked vaguely like Gurkhas. Uh, and, uh, and they were kind of, you know, walking around the compound. And it was vast. It was huge. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. And I'd been to just about every embassy in the world. And then you realize that you're not an embassy. You're more a forward operating base for the military. And as vast as it was, it was tiny compared to what the military had. And I remember going to my first uh, briefing for outside visitors. They were uh, governors from uh, several states who had National Guard contingent, uh, contingents. And so, uh, you know, I walk in and everyone at the table was military. I was the only civilian. There was one forlorn looking political uh, officer about a half a mile away uh, at the end of the table, uh, you know, flipping through Arabic language press clips. And I look around behind me, they're all military behind me. So, and so I thought, well, gosh, I mean, this looks kind of like a military briefing. And then lo and behold, they, they have this big uh, slideshow. And then General Odierno kind of goes through these slides. I think he had done it about a thousand times before. And he comes to slide 17, which was about the, uh, the uh, follow-on agreement that the United States would have with Iraq, this idea that we would have a kind of friendship agreement. And he says, Mr. Ambassador, would you like to make a comment? I said, yeah, sure. I'm glad I'm still awake here. And, and, uh, and, uh, and then I look over at the five governors, one of whom was Governor Perry from uh, Texas, who was very nice, by the way. Uh, uh, and they all had their little U.S. military tchotchke in front of them, you know, a nice military cup and a big uh, uh, coin that looked the size of a drink hole, uh, you know, a coaster or something. And... Uh, and so they asked a few questions, and I went upstairs and called an impromptu staff meeting. And I said, guys, you know, this is an embassy. We've got to sort of, can't we, I mean, can't we find an embassy cup to give these visitors or a baseball hat? And someone says, well, you know, who's going to pay for it? Uh, so I realized there that the embassy was really not launched and that we were more of an adjunct to the military. And I think that is a problem that has bedeviled us because as President Obama withdrew the troops. There was a sense among the Iraqis, no troops, no interest. And in fact, when you with, uh, President Obama had to withdraw those troops. And I know it's, it's customary today, given the ISIS crisis. And a lot of this ISIS crisis started out during the, uh, the surge. There was uh, somehow the view that uh, President Obama failed to keep troops there. Well, the problem with keeping troops there was the Iraqis were quite happy to keep U.S. troops in Iraq, but they had to be subject to Iraqi law. That is, no immunities of the kind that we would have in any other country where we base troops. The Iraqis simply would not allow what they considered invading troops to have immunities in their country. And moreover, they would say things to you that they wouldn't necessarily say to each other. So if you talk to Nouri al-Maliki, the charming prime minister that I had to deal with, a person who, if he ever had charisma, it cleared up a long time ago. Uh, uh, so you would uh, you would say, you know, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, we are prepared to keep 10,000 troops here. We're prepared to keep them here to help train up your forces. And I think we've learned some of the 
difficulties of training local forces. And Maliki would always say, absolutely, I completely agree with you. I just can't get the others to agree. And I can't take point on this because it's, you know, my words, but his thought. I can't be out in front on this because this is a huge issue for the Iraqi people that your troops cannot have immunity. And then you go to the others, the, you know, Alawi or, you know, the other uh, Iraqi politicians, and you explain, they say, we completely agree with you. We just can't convince uh, Prime Minister Maliki to agree. So this kind of stuff went on all the time. And the fact, there are a couple of things I noticed in dealing with Iraq. One is people will say one thing to you and another thing to someone else, especially when you have these one-on-ones, which in most countries, wow, I had a one-on-one. -on -one. I think I really know where the guy is. Nonsense. Uh, the guy is not where you think he is because you had a one-on-one. -on -one. And two, it was quite possible for people to hold two contradictory thoughts at the same time and not be bothered by, by the problems involved in that. So, so we were not able to get forces there. I think ideally what we might have done is pull forces out at the end of 2011, which by the way, un under the Bush administration in December 2008, there was a status of forces agreement and it called for the complete withdrawal of US troops by the end of 2011. I thought I'd mention that because no one else seems to recall it. What we could, might have done is withdraw them all in 2011 and then reintroduce them, obviously not invading troops, but rather training troops. But even then, the Iraqis never went for it. And I think by that time, once we withdrew them all, I think the president wanted to live with his campaign promises to withdraw troops from Iraq. So that never happened. I think this administration has its hands full, but I think uh, it needs to kind of try to deal with these issues um, with an understanding that uh, they're not going to go away. And with the understanding that you can't solve them all, you need to make things a little better for your successor than you found them in the first place. Thank you very much. Thank you. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.